yourself, Suzanne, if anyone is out there that can hear this, that has you, please, we'll do whatever it takes to bring you back. We love you. We miss you. Your girls need you. No questions asked. However much they want, I will do whatever it takes to get you back. Honey, I love you. I want you back so bad. That was Barry Morphew when his wife Suzanne went missing out in Colorado. And prosecutors, investigators, not necessarily believing what he was saying in that video because he's been charged with her murder. They still haven't found her. But based upon the investigation, the evidence they've collected, they have charged him with Suzanne's murder. Well, the attorneys were uh, back in court. But for those of you not familiar with this story, Ted Rollins has more for us. Oh, Suzanne, if anyone is out there that can hear this, that has you, please, we'll do whatever it takes to bring you back. We love you. We miss you. Your girls need you. That's Barry Morphew in a video posted on YouTube back in May of 2020, begging for his wife Suzanne's safe return. And just under one year after the 49-year-old mother of two vanished, her husband, Barry, was arrested and charged in her death. We're announcing that at 0915 hours this morning, the Chaffee County Sheriff's Office arrested Suzanne Morphew's husband, Barry Morphew. He was taken into custody near his home in Poncha Springs. He was alone at the time of his arrest, and he was arrested without incident. The investigation is still ongoing. Uh, Suzanne, her body has not been found, and we are still looking into that. The investigation is ongoing. Details of what happened to Suzanne are still unknown to the public, but Barry Morphew has been charged with tampering with a human body and first-degree murder. The Morphews lived in Maysville, Colorado, a rural area about two hours west of Colorado Springs. The family relocated from Indiana in 2018. Suzanne was last seen on Mother's Day in 2020. Her husband told investigators she went for a ride on her bike and never returned home. Her bike was found down a hillside off a trail, but no other signs of Suzanne. We're looking for torn clothing, human remains, and things of that nature. Suzanne's older brother, Andy Mormon, joined friends, family, volunteers, and law enforcement in the search for Suzanne. Mormon said he doesn't believe Barry's story about the Mother's Day bike ride. I'm nearly certain she never got on the bicycle. I honestly believe she was taken the night before Mother's Day. Um, just all the evidence points that way. And Suzanne's husband, Barry, was noticeably absent from the searches and from speaking publicly, something Andy Mormon found suspicious during the months he was looking for his sister. Very, very suspicious. I mean, if it was my wife missing, there's nothing that I wouldn't do. There is no level of cooperation that I wouldn't take care of. Uh, I just, I don't feel like Barry stepped up to the plate at all out there. He's a... Uh, kind of hidden himself from all you guys. And if it were me, I would want all the media attention I could get. I would be forming a search party just as I'm doing now. And uh, he hasn't done that, and that's troublesome to me. Barry previously told investigators that he was in Denver 150 miles away at the time Suzanne went missing. But prosecutors say Barry is accused of killing Suzanne sometime between May 9th and May 10th of 2020. And on May 5th, 2021, 360 days after Suzanne went missing, Barry Morphew was arrested near his home in Poncha Springs, Colorado. He is currently being held without bond. And they're still getting ready for the preliminary hearing in this case, but this was a huge investigation, a lot of information, a lot of exchange of information, mostly from prosecutors to the defense, obviously. And um, in court, uh, the, the judge found that prosecutors had not handed some stuff over in a, in a timely manner. Take a look. And found that there was a discovery violation, uh, but there were no sanctions for prosecutors. And they're over late, but no harm, no foul. The judge said, listen, just don't make a, a pattern of all this. Let's bring back in the think tank quickly. On that note, uh, Bernard, a big deal, not a big deal when, when the judge finds that you've violated the rules of discovery and... and, and uh, uh, but you're not sanctioned? Does that, does that happen a lot? So because the judge didn't sanction the prosecutor, the judge must have found that it wasn't so egregious in the sense of, look, 
the trial hasn't started. Actually, they haven't even done a preliminary hearing yet. So they're so far ahead of the ball at this point. There has been no prejudice to the defendant at this point. So I can see why the judge did not issue any sanctions, but gave a strong warning to the prosecutor like, look, come on, all discovery has to be turned over. All right, well, we got an idea of some of the things that were discussed during this hearing. Let's put that up on the screen, some of the evidence that exists. They handed over a terabyte of discovery. I don't know, is, is that a lot? Maybe it is. Uh, uh, the iPhone records, Kindle records, body cam videos, hotel surveillance video. I can't imagine what that is. Um, and then there was also a discussion that the FBI confronted Morphew with 26 exhibits in April. So let's bring back in the think tank. Uh, uh, Ian, let me begin with you. If you were handed a terabyte of discovery, would you be overwhelmed? Is that a lot? Is that a little? How much is that? So it's a ton. And Vinny, as you know, this is what I teach at the law school, cybercrime, and, and we handle cyber matters all the time. It's a lot of data. Uh, two lessons here that I take from this case, because I find this case very interesting. Uh, number one, when hiring defense counsel, make sure they understand technology and they have the resources to deal with mass amounts of data because very few cases today can escape the crime scene that is data. Number two, the prosecution has an obligation, a reasonable obligation, not just to hand it over, but to make it accessible to the defense. Think about it like this. They wouldn't hand over a uh, a, a treasure chest, let's say a chest somehow with a key lock on it closed and say, here you go, everything's inside. We've done, we've fulfilled our, our obligation. They have to give you the key. And here, this data comes in so many different formats, so many different forms with so many different ways to access it. Defense needs to be led to the proper protocols. So the state's got to get moving. They've got to say, look, here's the key to the chest. And then it's on the defense. The defense is going to have a lot of work in this case reviewing data. That's just the nature of criminal defense today. It has changed from what it was even five years ago. Well, you can always call a tech whiz like Brian Weiss, who is, <laughs> who is I mean, this guy is amazing. He's like his own walking IT department. Um, uh, which is more concerning to you, Brian, when, when, when prosecutors have a lot of evidence like this or when you hear the words, hotel surveillance video. Well, I'm not quite sure of the relevance of the hotel surveillance video. Neither am I. Maybe to show that, that the defendant's a bad guy. You know, Ian mentioned the word key. Uh, to me, the key, or one of the keys in this case, is that now famous 130-page probable cause affidavit. That, to me, is something that I would love to see, because mm -hmm. even in Colorado, Prosecutors do not go out and take a citizen into custody and charge him with the most serious crime that you can charge anybody with in this country, in the criminal justice system, without having a good faith belief that they have probable cause. That's why that now critical 130-page probable cause affidavit becomes important. But, but again, Ian makes a salient point. We have come so far from the days when I first started out where jurors weren't nearly as sophisticated Lawyers didn't have nearly the continuing legal education training that is now mandatory to be able to put them in a position where they can render reasonably, reasonably effective assistance to counsel. If you're going to hire me, trust me, it better be to do your appeal, your post-conviction writ, because I can't program my DVR. Yeah, uh, yeah, because uh, Brian used to get the discovery off of the ditto machine. The, the discovery would come <laughs> in and he'd go, oh, yeah, they just printed that Love one out. It. All Love right, it. Think Tank staying with us. When we come back, we're going to take you on the docket, a case we're tracking out of Georgia. A 17-year-old girl is shot and killed, but the defendant is claiming he's the victim of a racial attack. All that coming up.